Hello, this is Benjamin Boyce, and welcome to my virtual symposium. Today's guest is Dr. Jane Claire Jones. Jane Claire Jones is a feminist in the United Kingdom, and we speak about things that both of us have spoken about at length, but with the aim to figure out where the dialogue between feminists and men has gotten stuck. And I think we, I don't know if we necessarily make progress, but I think we start to outline things that could progress further than they have thus far. One extra note, this is the second dialogue we had. The first dialogue was more abstract and theoretical than this one. This one we talk about more real world issues. I will make available our first discussion in a couple days, probably most likely as a podcast version. Jane Claire Jones also has a blog and other resources that you can find in the description. I hope you enjoy. Here you go. The reason why things have kicked off in England, there are it's an interesting question. Why did things kick off in England? But the ostensible reason was that there was a government consultation on the um, amendment to the Gender Recognition Act, yeah. in which they were proposing. That's where the self ID conversation came about, mm-hmm. um, which finished in October, and then there was a very <clears throat> concerted Gosh. resistance, which oh, people yeah. had not anticipated. I mean. It's quite interesting. I mean, it's interesting that you've, I mean, you've interviewed Asher and Corinna, who are kind of allies of ours, but a number of the people you've interviewed are British, right? Because a lot of the, as the American media has been tearing their hair out, why, why is the British media so evil and transphobic? And I was just like, I don't know, we have a long and proud tradition of not liking authoritarians (laughs) telling us what to do. You know, we went to Cable Street, we weren't that very, we weren't very fond of Nazis. And generally, when people come along and start being madly dictatorial and telling us what we can and can't say and can and can't think, we get quite pissed off. (laughs) Yes, I think it's I think it's a noble part of our tradition. We were just like, you know, and we also have a long tradition of, you know, grassroots feminist activism, which kind Hmm. of has got lost. I mean, there's a kind of an interesting thing going on where the because radical feminism has been kicked out of the universities and replaced with this wishy washy third wave nonsense um Mm -hmm. a lot of the academics working in gender studies departments now are not grassroots feminist activists and don't seem to be that well connected i think to a lot of what's Mm. going on in the front lines and they just seem genuinely horrified that suddenly there's all these women going hang on a minute (laughs) Mm -hmm. what's going on who's taken over what where are the feminists? Why aren't they doing anything? We're, we're like, we're here. We're over, we're over here. We're not in. We, most of us don't have jobs in universities anymore, by the way, because those mm. people think sex doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And there was something that happened around the GRA campaign. It was actually kicked off by the attack on uh, Maria McLachlan. Really kind of galvanized people when one of the trans activists punched you know, a 60 year old woman. <laughs> at High Park Corner at early last year, and it really shook people, actually. Yeah. And it caused formation of Women's Place and like a whole bunch of other things. And lots of people just started... Converging? It's, and it's, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? What I, I was trying to think about it. I don't really know like what political momentum is, right? You can just hmm. feel it. You can feel it when it's happening. You can feel when there's traction and when there's not. Yeah. And and suddenly we were in the middle of it and we were like, whoa, <laughs> something's happening. You know, and the, suddenly the press were like, the women seem to be very upset about everything. There's a sh-. <laughs> the government were not expecting that resistance. They thought they were going to earn some easy woke points. Yeah. And <clears throat> What's the status of this uh, nascent movement at this point? It's a little more um, amorphous because we don't have a specific thing oh. we're campaigning against. Okay. Yeah. Well, our goal is to stop sex being legally and politically abolished. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> or to stop the recognition of sex being legally and politically abolished. Or in other words, to intellectually discredit the ideology of the contemporary form of the trans activist movement and mm-hmm. try and 
facilitate our trans allies in formulating a version of trans rights that is yeah. not bonkers and yeah that's negotiated with women's rights that's negotiated with women's rights and which which functions around mutual recognition right which is mm -hmm. what i've you know i've been saying to you or i've been saying in general right yes. the basis of justice is reach is mutual recognition if there is no mutual recognition you have a serious problem any political movement that grounds itself on a kind of narcissistic refusal to recognize any other stakeholders potential interests and indeed starts its political campaign by preemptively demonizing mm -hmm. the other stakeholders yes yeah is going to cause trouble right that is not going to work as a long-term political strategy um it could work in the short term and it has worked in the short term and it's worked in canada right and hmm. for whatever reasons england was really the first place where we put up enough resistance for there to be some kind of line in the sand drawn around the articulation of women's interests in relation to this and where we actually managed to get the press to start listening okay. and recognizing that we were not just a bunch of evil frothing nazis and actually mm. we had some quite legitimate questions and concerns yeah. about what happens when you legally because who knew legally and politically abolishing sex has some consequences <laughs> yeah well is is that this is this is something that i'm trying to figure out is is where we're at now not um the result of the decoupling of sex from gender um that was a move that feminists made at, at some point um no i mean i don't think so i mean there are some we can have a conversation about the continuity of the forms of the discourse right so that's a point that i'm prepared to explore right mm -hmm. to the extent that there has been a tendency in various forms of left-wing discourse to engage in this kind of like moral imperialism about like the other side's position and then go we don't i had i mean i was having an argument with this guy today because you know he turned up and started calling us witches slash turfs whatever usually when i say the word witch i mean turf but i like to not say it so i'll just say witch because that's effectively what it's doing so he turned up and started calling us whatever names yeah not nazis witches whatever and he and he did the kind of classic move well you don't talk to nazis you know you don't talk to racists you don't you know and i was like well no actually you, you do <laughs> like actually we do study the thought of national socialism right yes. we do study the thought of the ku klux klan and it's like this is not how we used to do this there was never an injunction after the second world war that we should not engage with the thought of like national socialism and try and understand mm. how that thought structure had evolved and what the basis of that thought structure was in fact the whole of like the, not the whole, but a very substantial impetus in the post-war French philosophy that I'm trained in specifically is attempting to think about how the Holocaust was possible and like what thought structures enabled that to happen in order to make that mm -hmm. something that doesn't happen again. Of course, it does happen again over and over and over again because people have very, comes back to the either or thing, right? Like yeah, yeah. good, bad virtuous like sinful you know yeah. this very totalizing structure anyway we can have a conversation about the way in which a moral imperative and left-wing thought can tend towards that kind of thinking and i'm happy to have that conversation and i think it's worth thinking through because it's a real because you need the commitment of the left to there being an ethical foundation to politics i think is very important but it can slip very easily into this kind of moral imperiousness which i think is very problematic um is this the result of trying to decouple sex from gender mm, no i think it's the result of people not understanding the difference between sex and gender if people actually understood the radical feminist argument yeah one of the things that's interesting about trans activism is it completely fails to understand the difference between sex and gender. So it thinks that if we want to undo oppressive gender structures, the only way to do this mm -hmm. is by pretending sex doesn't exist, mm -hmm. right? In that respect, it's actually 
<clears throat> a symptom of the failure of second wave feminism to make mm. its point. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, hmm. Because there is there is an impetus in in the trans project which all of us of a second wave disposition are very sympathetic to, which is dress however you want, express yeah. yourself however you want. Like you know. The idea that we would be offended by male people wearing dresses or scared of them even, like, mm -hmm. is, doesn't make any sense, right? We might have some concerns about whether people are wearing male, whether male people are wearing dresses so that they can access, like, females in a state of undress. That might be mm -hmm. a question. Mm -hmm. Like, because men do all kinds of weird things to try and get access to vulnerable people <laughs> mm -hmm. like pan-catholic mm -hmm. priests and gym instructors mm -hmm. and various other things <laughs> so it's not improbable right so we might have a question about that but in the general scheme of things no radical feminist is interested in policing people's gender expressions expressions right? okay yeah like or how they perform their gender or even how they understand yeah. their gender right okay like we tend to not think of it as an essential thing, right? I don't think I have a gender. I think I have a personality. Yeah. And then I think that personality is given signification. So even when I say, I mean, last time we were talking, I was trying to distinguish patriarchal masculinity from patriarchal femininity, from masculinity yeah. and femininity. But even masculinity and femininity are still just, I think, personality types and we might i mean i'm prepared to say that there's like a very loose bimodal distri distribution mm -hmm. so there may be mm -hmm. some yeah i'm not a total blank slatist like i'm prepared to accept statements like men might be more spatializing and women might be more relational or yeah yeah might be better at manipulating objects and women might be but as very general tendencies yeah yeah right in terms of I don't believe men are like innately incapable of experiencing pain or expressing fear or these types of things. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that's yeah. Cult that's culture. <laughs> huh. um, but generally, I think people have personalities. Maybe there's a very loose distribution. The distribution is actually so loose, I don't see any function in gendering that distribution. Mm -hmm. Right, because mm. actually mm -hmm. it constrains people, and it's clear that the boxes are much more constraining than the actual distribution. So, as far as we're concerned, there's personalities, there's sex, which is whether you are male or female, and this is not as massively complicated and difficult to comprehend <laughs> as people like to imagine. Humans are actually remarkably good at distinguishing the sex of other humans mm -hmm. within, generally within nanoseconds of laying eyes on them yeah. and um, this whole idea that we can't and it's terribly complicated is um, it's just it's nonsense and I'm sorry like stop instrumentalizing intersex people and there's a class of humans that produce ova and who get pregnant and are capable of bearing live young and then there's yeah. a class of humans that produce sperm and are capable of impregnating people that's it it's really not hot <laughs> but uh, when, it, when it comes into a social situation um what you're advocating for is that the those who produce ovum are given um spaces where they will not be uh will, they won't be directly accessed by people who produce the sperm um right. you, you, there is some sort of essential uh distinction that you want to reproduce on a cultural level like on, well, on it, it is it, it is reproduced we have single sex spaces mm -hmm. right so that that exists and we have a wide variety of single sex spaces <clears throat> both male and female so men also have single sex spaces mm -hmm. so conventionally in places where we are undressed or in some state of vulnerability, we separate the sexes, yes. right? For fairly obvious reasons, <laughs> both for well, comfort and for dignity yeah. and also for safety. Yeah, yeah. Um, in places where people are sleeping very often, in hostels, in places like that, yeah. like, where people have to change and sleep and do more intimate, vulnerable things, we separate people by sexes. Um, we do when we're providing certain kinds of women's services. Yeah. Um, we already have that. 
and we have legislation, we have exemptions in the equalities legislation in this country, which allows us to do that, which allows us okay. to restrict certain kinds of services to female people only. But now so, that's being construed as, as an assault to the identification of somebody who identifies as a female, even if they have a, a uh, you know, right. the, produ- the ability to produce sperm. Right. And our argument would essentially be, you can identify as a woman, you can't identify as female. Because being female is not an identity. Hmm. That's like identifying as having blue eyes when you've got brown yeah. eyes. Yeah, or, or that you're uh, that you're 23 when you're 56. Or that you're 23 when you're 56. There are certain material realities about your being, mm-hmm. your height, your sex, the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, the tone of your skin. Let's not say race because that is more socially constructed where we draw those mm-hmm. lines and what they mean right but those are not identities Hmm. yeah being brown haired is not an identity being blue eyed is not an identity it might be an identity if it then becomes like aryan or something yeah yeah if you then give it a a racialized meaning the question is we don't know exactly what the word woman means right a lot of people Hmm. will argue that woman just means adult human female but woman actually I think from a philosophical cultural perspective is a much more complicated thing than just being an adult human female. It's being an adult human female within a particular kind of society, which attributes certain meanings to being an adult human female. And it's a whole load of stuff. We're discussing this all the time, right? How we want to think about this. There are certain portions of the people I'm allied with who are absolutely uh, dead set. Women means adult human female. Male people are not any type of woman under any circumstance. I'm a little bit more flexible about that because I think women does have, it does have cultural meanings under the present circumstances. This is problematic. Yes. Because obviously we're going to say, well, those cultural meanings are in a lot of respects sexist. So you're saying, you know, so that, that causes issues, Mm, mm -hmm. but under the present set of circumstances, I'm prepared to accept that some people want to perform the social role of women. Mm -hmm. And that then they are not necessarily straightforwardly men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I'm very clear about is they're not female. Yeah. Well, I mean that 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 makes sorry. There's not just cultural. uh, There's not just cultural implications of man and woman. There's also personal implications, like the way that the way that I feel towards a woman is going to be different than the way that I feel towards a man. Just like on a. There's probably there's. I'm talking about the biology of that. You know whether right. Not necessarily. I'm not just talking about sexual attraction, but there's a there's a host of of motivations that that are summoned when I'm dealing with a woman. Uh, were, that are different than when I'm dealing with a man. Now, the the interesting thing that I've experienced when interacting and becoming friends with and getting close to certain very few trans people is that that biology information is kind of confused. Like I don't know where, mm-hmm. how the how the feelings are arranged and stuff. And I need I'm entering into like I'm navigating as I establish right. a friendship, a completely different set of expectations. And I, I, you can probably say that some of them, some of my um, feelings and thoughts and all that stuff is sexist, but some of it's just a, not sexist in a negative way. It's just like there's just a difference between the way in which I've always interacted with male and, and men and women, just like on a social level, um, the right. way that friendships go and the way that that I attend to them and the, the, the expectations that I feel coming from them to me. Um, so it's just, it's interesting to, to enter into a friendship like that, um, with somebody who isn't, uh, who, who's, who's trans and there's like some sort of interesting middle ground in there. Yeah, there, 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 there is a middle ground. Right. And I feel, but I, I cannot think- force myself I can I can force myself to to use pronouns and stuff, but I cannot force myself to summon feelings and that whole set of attitudes. I don't want to be forced to feel that person as a woman. Um, I don't think you can be. I mean, I think I think on this and this on this we we completely agree. Probably. I mean, I've written some stuff on my blog. I, I started calling it ontological totalitarianism. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Which people seem to like for some reason that kind of went off somewhere, but. You cannot mandate people's perceptions, right? Yes. There's something very, very not okay 
about attempting to mandate people's perceptions yes about anything right even even if i didn't have all of the uh you know political critiques and ideological critiques and concerns about what this represents i would be very very concerned about any political movement that grounded itself on mandating that people perceived something contrary to what they actually perceive Mm -hmm. that's a really dangerous move to make that's 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 why I call it ontological totalitarianism. At, at its core, like not allowing people to make free judgments and expressions about their own perceptions, yes, is really, really, really deeply authoritarian in a way that I am not okay with. Particularly when it's it's two plus two equals four, yeah, two plus two equals five, right? We yeah. we talk about this, right? Once you ground the problem with transactivism is it's grounded on two plus two equals five. It's grounded on something which is not true, right? Which is that male and female people don't exist and male people can identify as female people and female yeah. people can identify as male people. Um, and there's, there are reasons why it is grounded in that way. It doesn't have to be. Like, as you've, you know, when you talk to Corinna or, you know, Asha or yeah. any of our allies, right? There are ways of negotiating the trans experience, which is a real experience, Right? And I have a lot of time for exploring that and, and being compassionate about what it is like to negotiate that. No one thinks it's easy. But there are ways of negotiating that that don't involve deciding that you have to convince everyone that cats are dogs and dogs yeah. are cats. But in, inside of activism is the, is the seed uh, or a certain portion of activism is sculpting or changing perceptions. Yeah, so but there's if, a difference if, between changing value perceptions about value and changing Mm. perceptions about reality yeah and i think that that might dovetail with with the that the separation of gender and sex or the abolition of of sex by the gender uh, movement maybe what you were saying about the left and and the moral imperialism that that's a threat if if one is not very careful and aware in the way that they're um being an activist and trying to challenge and uh, and rearrange values or show different values that the demand is different than the proposition or there has to be I mean, isn't there some sort of totalitarian um, seed inside of activism that wants to force people to act differently or to perceive things differently? Um, I think wanting to get people to act differently is not inherently totalitarian if you have a decent account of why the thing that you want them to stop doing is a harm right i don't think there's anything inherently totalitarian about providing a critique which says in this society we do not value this thing well yeah okay or we we overvalue it or we undervalue it so for example we were talking last week about women's domestic labor right yeah, yeah. i don't think it's inherently totalitarian to say hey guys women are doing all of this work and it's not being given an adequate value yeah either socially or economically or whatever because 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 there's exploitation involved in that right that labor is then appropriated by bodies which are then appropriated by industry yeah. and tapped into other people's profit. So there's the critique, but then there's the activism. And there's a danger in activism of overreach or of uh, such growing frustration that totalitarian contingent can there's rise a, there's within a, there's, a da- there's a danger. I think the danger is in um, assuming absolute moral righteousness and assuming that anybody who... Hmm doesn't agree with you or objects to you or raises questions or interrogates you Mm. is bad yeah right there's a tendency on the left to be extremely moralistic about the right and assume all people on the right are just evil Um, i think yeah the 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 the, the same thing is mirrored in the on the right uh, right okay it's a tendency of human thinking right this has become particularly you know, pronounced in the left recently in terms of like all these mechanisms of discursive control and we don't talk to racists and we don't talk yeah. to these people, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. This is all terribly unhelpful, right? Um, 
because even more than I'm a leftist, I'm an anti-authoritarian, right? Mm. So, um, <laughs> not all feminists are authoritarians. Who knew? <laughs> 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 well, this shot. is a great this is a great opportunity to show that um, to, uh, just by by um, contrasting uh, the proper modality of critique and activism. Well, it's, it's very emperor. it's very it's very difficult. I mean, you know, we need to talk about the Gillette thing, right? At some point, so yeah. feminism has a problem, right? Because it's very difficult for us to make critiques without everyone screaming <laughs> and going, "Ah, you're emasculating us!" Ah, mm, right. Mm. So the tendency in feminism, and I'm not going to say there is no authoritarianism and feminism, no, no feminist has ever been an authoritarian, right? I'm not going to say that. But in general, most of the feminists I know are not screaming authoritarians, right? Which is why we have not actually succeeded in our political project, because we're not that authoritarian, <laughs> oh, right? Shoot. We're not actually going to like uh. force people to do things what we've mostly done hmm. is you know if we were authoritarians we might have had a tiny impact on the rate of sexual violence in the society and we haven't and it's exactly the same no. as it is, is it it's it's yes. com completely the same it hasn't changed at all it, it hasn't it's barely changed right hmm. and the rate of conviction is barely changed men feel incredibly threatened about the state as it currently is and that current state is that we have actually got Fuck, like, made virtually no fucking progress whatsoever in challenging, mm. tackling the amount of sexual violence in the society, or in or making any substantive improvement to the rate of conviction, which is still okay. appalling. Like, if you actually look at the rate of incidences of sexual violence to the amount of conviction, about ninety nine percent of the time, you're going to get away with it. That's how mm. bad it is. Mm. Like, that's why we're upset. <laughs> okay. And we, we've, we've really made very little progress, right? Because basically what we do is we produce critiques and we produce lots of books and lots of research and we do a really thorough job and mm. we try and explain. And mostly, actually, people don't listen to us because the, mm. the pastor mm. is just like, every now and again, someone will come along and attempt to do something but it's very very difficult because you're trying to move an entire massive structure and and you can see we i we would say from the response to something like what happened whatever the last couple of days with this advert how extreme the resistance is hmm. Have, has well, there been no change in the cultural uh, values of uh, of woman over the last hundred years, uh, over the last fifty years? Oh no, there's, there's, there's been a lot of change in formal equality. Right, we did a really good job with formal equality. Um, mm. There has been a lot of progress with women in the workplace. Obviously, there has been a certain amount of progress with women's political representation mm -hmm. and women occupying positions in public life. What we haven't done really i think is very substantially affected how women's participation in public life relates to how power is exercised in public life like that's what i would like to see a lot more of yeah you want more power <laughs> <laughs> no i want power to be exercised less hierarchically hmm that, I want, hmm. I want, I want, I want power to be exercised. To come back to the conversation we had about dominance and authority, I want us yeah. to think a lot about how people can have authority and exercise power in a in a mode that is more um, relational. More, more is more relational. Is more based on mutual recognition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas women, very often, because they're entering public spaces or public institutions that are structured principally by men to a certain degree our success in entering public life has 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 related to our success in being equal to men in the modalities that men have already established and something like domestic the places where we've been a lot less successful are to, are to do with male violence right which is what the whole me too thing is about to some extent Mm -hmm. what the whole Gillette thing is about to some extent and that promotes a lot 
more resistance. That's very, very hard to work with because it creates, it's, it's, I mean, I wanted to talk to you about this because we started talking about this at the end of the last time. Like, how do we yeah. get men? Yeah. How do we get men to listen? Like, how how can we have this conversation? Well, the, the I, thing I mean, about I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that. I mean, because because you know, if there is a way of us having that conversation that doesn't promote the amount of butt hurt screaming that that advert promoted, well, that would be great. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the the see, this is the thing. Um, even 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 a gentle critique of that and i i'm sure that i was wrong on well i'm, I'm sure that somebody could disagree with me on every single point that i made because I, I did a f almost a frame by frame breakdown of the gillette video and i was just yeah. responding to it right and and i just broke it down as a narrative and blah 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 and i'm sure you could go through and and disagree with me on any given point but the fact that i was disagreeing with or critiquing it um would automatically be seen i even said this in the video would be seen as me being an incel me uh me being butt hurt um just for the fact of me engaging in the discourse and picking it apart and because i didn't agree i was automatically could be perceived as somebody who's raging against that um so so the, okay, the so, perception so, so I, I of haven't... resistance to that so so okay so as being that's, thoroughly that's right. I, I haven't, isn't helpful I have... right no i mean okay it, it is probably not helpful for us to say, to use that phrase, right? Yeah. We use that phrase, right? Because it's incredibly dispiriting, right? To see that response. And hmm. um, because, because what we hear is, what we hear and what we're responding to is the fundamental structure, right? Which is, you're making us bad, feel bad, by implying that we're rapists, and our bad feelings about that matter way, way more than the fact that you're being raped. That's what we hear. What we hear is an immediate default to our feelings. Our hurt feelings matter more than the damage that's being done to you. Isn't is and that that's, not that's, a chance to examine the way in which you're communicating and say this is maybe this is not the correct maybe shame is not the correct mode of, of But that advert wasn't shaming. That advert was incredibly positive. Yeah, there was no shaming involved. Really? The fact there was no shaming involved. It was like that advert was basically okay, so the women have been speaking about the fact that they have been being abused, yeah? We've been ignoring this. It's time we didn't ignore this anymore. It's time that we all stood hmm. up and showed them that we're really fucking decent. Yeah. That's not shaming. Well, the yeah, it is because it, 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 it assumes that people are ignoring that. that that's the assumption that the but, male's but, but, default but, but, stance is ignorance, is not being okay, but, but as soon a stand-up guy. As soon as, you, as soon as you... Right. But this is always the thing. We can't get past this. Right? Yeah. So I think it's, communica it's a problem it's, of because, communication. Because there's no way of talking about male violence in which hmm. men don't immediately default to, I'm one of the good guys. Why are you talking to me? I'm the good guy here. And Everything. why is that? Because it's because obviously it's, you don't think it's the fault of the communication; it's the fault of because the. Because how is it possible for us to make a comment about a phenomenon, yeah. a social phenomenon, that is the product of a class of people? Mm -hmm. Right. I understand. Hmm. Right. When you hear a critique of a class when you are a member of that class there is a momentary sense of defensiveness i feel the same thing when i read something that starts with white people yeah mm -hmm. but i also understand there is a reason to make a critique of a certain way in which whiteness functions in this society mm -hmm. right it's a critique it's not it's not aimed at me personally, 
right? The the point that where we where the problem is, right, mm. is I recognise that there is a there is a there is a momentary bit of defensiveness. The problem is we never get past that defensiveness. Hmm. We never get past that. It just gets stuck at you're not talking about I don't know, I'm one of the good okay. guys. And well, okay. Men. Well, what's on the other so, side of that then? Let's and, skip and, that then. And, I mean, calling and, that out, do, and, I, I think, is just going to invoke more defensiveness. But what, what is the question? Is yeah. What is what is what is what is it that can't be heard? Right. What is it about women pointing to male mm-hmm. violence that men cannot hear? Well, I, th- that that formulation, it, it's really hard for me to get around because are you talking about me being violent? Or are no, you I'm talking about every... M- I'm talking about the fact that violence is a feature, it's a statistical observation, right? Yeah. The majority of the violence comes from male people. Yeah. So that's a statistical fact. Men are statistically the people who are violent, Yeah. right? So, this is true across. Yeah, but w- w- what's what what portion of men? What, what what what's the statistic? How many men out of a hundred? I don't know how many men out of a hundred. Well, yeah, right? that, that's what I'm saying. So, so if but you it, want but, to, but, but, you, you but, have to but, narrow it down and then start looking at the the psychology of. But the question, but the question is, is it the case, right, that the majority, the vast, the overwhelming majority of the of violence? Men? Or of, of violence. No, of the violence. Yeah, that's the okay. So that's the is, first decision. Right. So if we look at for classic examples, right, um, like shooting sprees, like yeah. shooting up buildings. Yeah. Oh, it's, those are all men. Well, women has never done that. Yeah, and almost always white men as well. Young white men. Right. Mm-hmm. So, for, from our perspective, if this was any mm-hmm. other group. Yeah, Mm -hmm. if this was Muslims or black people or even women, we would notice. We would notice that this group of people were the people who were disproportionately being violent. The fact that it's mostly men, overwhelmingly men, Mm -hmm. and in our culture, because we live in a white culture, very largely white men doing that, Mm -hmm. yeah, that leads us to ask a question. We, have, we then have two options, right, when we're confronted with that fact. Either there's something wrong fundamentally with men or there's something going on in the structure of our cultural systems, mm-hmm. right? Hmm. Okay. Now, feminism, and we don't all agree on this, and some, form of, some forms of radical feminism are much more biologically determinist than this, and I don't really have any time for that, right? Mm-hmm. That Gillette advert was not saying this problem is because there is something inherently wrong with men. It was saying there are some aspects of male behavior that might be Mm -hmm. related to this and we don't have to behave like that. Mm -hmm. Right? The only shame that was involved was pointing to the fact that Mm -hmm. there is some issues of male violence. And we don't know how to confront male violence without pointing at it. And we keep pointing at it because actually it's invisibilized, right? Mm. Because it's the wall, because it's the wallpaper. Because if it was black men or if it was um, Muslims or if it was trans people or if it was any other group mm. that was not the default human, the thing is men are default humans. When most of the violence is performed by the default human, the violence becomes default human violence. Right, you don't see it. I don't think men are inherently. There might be some issues around testosterone and various issues, right? So testosterone does make you slightly more have, have a slightly higher tendency to be aggressive. But we know there are ways of, of structuring social relations which massively decrease levels of male violence. There are some societies that have much lower levels of male violence than we do. There are some societies that have almost no rape. Hmm. because they structure things differently. And does that uh, structure scale? Did, could you give me a, an example of such a culture? Okay, so most of those 
they, they are to some extent matriarchal cultures, right? But in most of those cultures, what happens is that when the when people form pair bonds, right? So when young humans form pair bonds, rather than the woman going and living with the male family, the male comes and lives with the female's family, with the woman's family. Hmm. And it's not only to do with that, but it's to do with how power is then organized in those societies, and also it's to do with the symbolic structures, right? So most hmm. of those societies are essentially earth mother worshipping cultures yeah. rather than warrior cultures right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and they have very low levels of rape hmm. so i'm not claiming we have to turn it into one or the other like i've yeah. said i think okay. there's a balance that we can find right but at the moment we're descendants of a warrior culture right indo-europeans are warriors we're warrior people the people who lived in europe before the Indo-Europeans came, had a very different culture Hmm. to the Indo-European culture. The Indo-Europeans are horse-riding, sun-worshipping, monotheistic, warrior people. (laughs) And to some extent, this is overly simplistic, but to some extent, that is part of our, if you look at it from Greek mythology, the Greeks are one of the earliest settled Indo-European people in Europe, because the Cretans were there before, and the Cretans were... Neolithic and much more mm. matrilineal. Um, hmm. So the foundation of like Western culture in Greece is, to some extent, an interesting story about the writing of a patrilineal culture over a matrilineal culture and how that works. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, but I think there are ways of creating hmm. something which has a better balance right yeah i don't want a society in which men feel dominated right i don't want a society in which anyone feels dominated people being dominated is not good for humans (laughs) Hmm. i do want a society in which there is less violence i want there to be a lot and also Hmm. this would be better for everyone right because actually (laughs) ironically a society with this level of violence actually is, is is even in terms of like you know male desire for like pair bonding it's counterproductive and produce a society in which women are essentially scared and sexually traumatized mm-hmm. that's not <laughs> that's not the best way of 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 this working out for any mm. of us yeah right? i wonder i wonder if it's not either somehow uh Inisible to what it is to be or inherent to what it is to be a man or just a what it, it's inherent what it is to be a man in this culture that uh, It's very difficult for me and probably the people who responded cri- Critically and there's probably a spectrum of critique. That's all I wanted to say There's a spectrum of critique from reasonable to unreasonable just because it's a creek doesn't mean that it's unreasonable But uh, there might be a spectrum uh, that might be initiated because we're more interested in solutions and and if we get if we were shown the next step, like, okay, there, this is the, this is the critique. This is the problem. And, and we engage in the solution, um, or at least we're led towards a solution. And, and that's kind of my critique on it. Like the, the second half of that Gillette ad was positive and said, like, let's, let's, let's be heroes. Let's go and, you know, champion, uh, the good thing, but it, it framed it all on most men are most men, only some men are heroes. Most men are default uh, sexual harassers and bullies by default. That, and that's the way it framed it on a, on a structural level. We can. Get, I don't want to get distracted. It, didn't, by it never. That. It never said. It never said most men though. That's what you heard. That's said, that, that's implied. That's that's implied by by going over and over and, and especially with the the phrase "boys will be boys will be boys will be boys will be boys." That that phrase itself. And this is a problem that I have with a lot of societal. Um, discourse is that we take a phrase and we only see it as meaning one thing when a phrase by its very use can be used as a number of different things it can be used boys could be bo- boys will be boys could be used as just an expression of exasperation so that you don't over over go overboard on judging negatively or too severely that boy or it could be used as a mask for behavior but it's not always just a we men don't go around excusing other men 
we we don't do that. There's a there's a large thing if 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 and if that was recognized that there is a large you know kind of a chivalrous uh, uh, cultural uh, structure. Like, I, and I don't know if you even can see that, but there, for me, like, we, we are shaped and we're in constant contention, like, like from my own, uh, being, gr- growing up as a, as a pastor's kid, you know, and being taught, like, that I respect women, I, I do this thing, I don't do this thing, that, that's bad, this is good, and, and I was taught to be very okay, okay, deferential uh, 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 okay. to the opposite sex, right? So, Right. So do we want to but, revert but, back but, to a society but, but, where but, that but, was but my but 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 but, but my question but my question right the thing is when you say men don't excuse other people's other men's behavior yeah. they do maybe you don't right yeah but they do right they, they do. see this is the problem like that they is maybe, that like a maybe, huge okay, is that okay. just, is it the just, majority just for, like the, just for one second yeah. attempt to try and not take it personally Right. I'm try just saying and, I, I constantly say get accused of, of about... talking about all women when I talk about women, right? Like so it the no, stereotype when you say when you say women, I understand that you're talking about a broad social category of behaviors. Right. Yeah. We don't run around saying not all women. There's a reason why we have not all men as a kind of joke catchphrase. Hmm. And I understand I'm I I mean I wrote about this after our conversation last time, right? Hmm. I understand there is a moment of defensiveness, right? Yeah. We all feel it, right? That's a natural human response. Yeah. I totally recognize that. Because if you're put in a class and the class is said, something bad is said about the class and you don't feel that that's representative of you, you feel mm. that your individuality has been erased mm. by that class judgment. Yeah. And, and there is a natural human response, mm. right? Because when we're dealing with each other, and, and, and I will totally say this about feminism and about all of these things, right? When we are dealing with each other as individuals, we should deal with each other as individuals, right? You should not treat another human being as an instantiation, as a representative or as a cipher of a class. They're not. They're an individual, right? When I meet a male person, I do not treat them as like a walking instantiation of patriarchy. Hmm. I treat them as another human being. If they then start exhibiting behaviors that are characteristic of certain types of aspects of male behavior I'm familiar with, then I'm going to slightly alter my perception, but I'm going to allow them to exist as an individual before I treat them as a, because that's dehumanizing, right? Hmm. I understand that, right? It's not acceptable, and this is a mistake the left does make, right? It has this tendency to turn people into ciphers, and then it's one of the things that intersectionality is really, really, the way it's it's practiced out in space, out there, it's one of the reasons I really dislike it, right? Because it turns every single person into a cipher, and then the science points to them, and it's incredibly dehumanizing, right? And Hmm. that's, I I, I get that, right? I, I know what that feels like, yeah? So I'm not yeah. saying that that reaction is coming from nowhere. Yeah. I guess what we're trying to say is we also need to be able to make analyses about okay. about things that work at a structural level. Yeah. Because the problem is structural. <clears throat> there is not a problem with all men. There is not even a problem with most men. There is a problem with a certain portion. And there is a there is a problem with a certain type hmm. of masculine conditioning, right? Hmm. Okay. And I, re- hmm. you know, I recognise we've had, you know, we we don't live in these weird little silos where we don't interact with any men, right? We're like, you know, like <laughs> we we know you're, we know you're human beings, right? We yeah. do understand that, right? But but when we say something like men when you say men don't excuse other men's behavior right Hmm. i'm very prepared to hear many men do not do that but some men do yeah right and in a you know if you look at the and these things are particularly egregious for example around the prosecution of violent crime against women Right. I think what you have to understand from women's perspective is that we are subject to actually really large amounts of very traumatizing and egregious violence. 
And some of that violence is horrendous, like really horrendous. You know, there was a man who killed his girlfriend in England last year. And the, the, the trial was two weeks ago and mm. like they were having rough sex, but I can't even say what he did. Right. Because mm. I, we were all like, and I look at this stuff all the time. Right. Um, yeah. And he just left her. Like, he did something to her which was incredibly damaging to her and he lacerated her vagina and then he just let her bleed to death. Mm -hmm. And he got two and a half years. And because it does get excused. It gets excused when a man has a bright future. He has a good scholarship. He comes from a good family, blah, 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 blah. Like, and it's it's not acceptable. There are huge, huge women are dealing with a massive amount of trauma, and we want it to stop. Yeah, we just want it to stop, yeah. right? We want to stop growing up, coming into adulthood, and coming to understand that as a class of people, we are carrying a huge amount of trauma. It's not acceptable. The largest amount of PTSD in any population anywhere in the world at any time in history is among women hmm. because of that violence. And we, we just want it to stop. And we don't know how to talk about it. Okay. Because when we do, it creates this kind of response. And I don't know how hmm. we can talk about it without, because hmm. what we, the reason why we, we get sneery and start going on oh, your butt hurt, right? Is because what we hear is your feelings about being a, that little bit of defensiveness that is natural, which I understand is m much more important than you trying to understand the amount of damage that is being done and hmm. doing something about it. And you're good people, right? Well, what you're can be done about it? What can be done about it is that men start communicating i mean actually i mean that ad was cheesy right but what well, can and be plus done it's an ad too so it's a corporation well, yeah, no, I mean, that's playing no, us it's, okay, it's like, so. of course they're playing us right and, okay, and okay. there's a huge amount of publicity yeah. and it's all great and like i'm an anti-capitalist <laughs> right so like yeah <laughs> Okay. Like, of course, okay. right? Like, Just want to and, put and, that out there. And, and, the fa and the fact that we're, like, depending on Gillette for, uh, like, our moral salvation or otherwise, <laughs> I mean, like, fuck this, right? But, <laughs> but it was an interesting moment, right? But what was hmm. interesting, because we were all sitting there just, like, pouring our hair out, right? And, of course, then we turn around and we start sneering and we're like, oh, you're a bunch of crybabies, right? And it's not help. That's not helpful either. But, what, but the reason why we respond like that is because what we hear is, hmm. is... What we hear is, an, is we want mutual recognition, right? And what we hear is we can't get past our own defensiveness long enough to try and recognize how much damage is being done to you hmm. and what we might be able to do about it. Even if it doesn't give solutions, right? Then we can have a conversation. Okay, we need this to stop. There are, there are, lots, of men, there are, there are lots of men working with us, right? Who work hmm. with other men to try and talk about what it is, about what aspects. It's not the whole of masculinity. Right, the whole of masculinity does not need to be junked. There are just some portions of it that tend to promote certain kinds of behaviour, hmm. and men need to work with other men about that. Right? We we can't. Women, we're not a bunch of Nazis. We can't enforce that change. It can only come from men ultimately, yeah. and we would like those conversations to happen. And this is what's happening when Gillette. It's a man's organization tries to talk to men and then the men are all like, we're not going to buy your bloody races anymore. <laughs> it's like, okay. But hmm. it's a question about whose feelings. Like, sometimes you need to get over yourself a little bit just to try and see what someone's saying. And, and I, I, I know it's difficult. Yeah. I know it's difficult. Yeah. But anyway, there you go. So I will look at your video and then I will probably send you extensive notes. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I even I even called myself out. I'm like, I'm going to get hell for saying that. Because um, I'm trying to... I think it goes back to what we were saying about... Um, what the, the wonderful thing, even though it's problematic with the trans rights movement, um, is that it 
it's providing an opportunity for feminists to actually step outside of the bubble of being contentious against males um, and, and casting it in another light. And, and it, it's an opening for dialogue and sympathy um, and, and connection, um, possibly. Uh, I, hope, I hope so. I mean, yes. And so, so what I've been what I've been doing with with the with the trans experience, and then the trans uh, and the critique of of activist uh, radical activism, tra radical trans rights activism, is to forward and to promote the the best examples of trans people that I I've been able to find, and and probably that's you've, biased. You've chosen, you've, cho because, you've, chosen some, you've chosen some very good examples because because you know I'm I'm making a value judgment because I I like the way they think and they probably I agree with them out the gate. So like I, I want to just say that I'm probably biased a little bit because we probably agree, but um, but going into the connecting and 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 making inroads with the feminist community is. It's it's difficult um, because one because like I I have a bunch of issues with it and and I've seen some negative examples and then once I do that once I step into this community and start to make inroads with it I'm inviting a whole bunch of critique that I'm shielded from because I'm just in my echo chamber over here I'm just in this like loosely uh, anti-progressive or like a critique of progressivism bubble and now I'm trying to make inroads with that but I want to make inroads by trying to figure out how do we navigate these issues? How do we, when we point out that somebody's being defensive, how do we not make them even more defensive um, by pointing that out? Like, and I think that one I want to propose, and I don't know if this is right or not, is to focus more on the solutions. Like, what are the what are the behaviors that that do um, diminish uh, violence? That do. Um, change the way in which men uh, treat women and and entering into that discussion one more point um, in the Gillette article uh, I I just I was just going through the images and I was stacking the images and showing the different images of women as they were presented and the the different images of men as they were pre presented and mm -hmm. one of the things that I said and and I, I need to just come out and and say this is that um, there's this the way that certain women were dressed there's these two passages or two little excerpts of of men approaching women or men about to approach women and and they were they were denied by another man like like another man stopped one man from approaching a woman. In both of those cases, the the women were very scantily dressed. They were either in bikinis or in like very form fitting clothes. And the the what I was trying to say is that not that the woman is responsible for the man's behavior, but there is a cultural significance to the way in which a woman presents herself. And we need to understand that both parties need to be aware of their power over the other party. Like a, a attractive woman does have, and I don't, I don't understand why it's so hard for us to enter just to admit this, that an attractive woman is attractive because she has a certain draw on men. And then one of the critiques that I didn't say but has appeared in in my comment section is that the critique isn't that the woman is is um it's not that the woman doesn't want attention. She just only wants attention from the very cream of the crop. She doesn't want attention from anybody except for the the one that she would be attracted to. But she, there's still in a uh, <coughs> there's still a social significance and value to the way that a woman presents herself. And I'm not saying that we all need to wear burkas. I'm just saying we have to grapple with the social. There there needs to be a negotiation that takes factors into account. Okay, I'm. I have. I have multiple things to say about this. Obviously, <laughs> <laughs> just sit there and just like, oh my god. No, I I, I brought it up because I knew and I wanted to get. I wanted to. I wanted it's feminists exactly, to get a chance yeah, the first, to. The, 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 the first thing you have to say. First thing we have. I mean. Obviously, I'm going to end up talking to you about men being responsible for their own desire. But, yes. the, but, but the first thing I'm going to say is, is that one of the things you have to understand yeah, is that femininity is a double bind. So one mm. of the things about how, a, how oppression works right, is that you're given two options hmm. and both of them have a penalty of some type. Hmm. Right? So what you have to understand about our experience of the world yeah, in terms of how we're conditioned, because the structure is around 
like I was saying to you last time, the fact that we are principally positioned as being things that are, that are attractive to men. Our value is there as objects of men's attraction, right? Mm, okay. Um, and femininity, as it's performed, is about accentuating our attractiveness to men. It's also about constraining our agency. So mm -hmm. one of the things you'll notice about a lot of the things that are associated with conventional performances of femininity is that they actually restrict your movement, right? Hmm. So a lot of gender non-conforming women are gender non-conforming women, not necessarily because they have decided to be gender non-conforming, it's just because they would like to be able to walk down the street comfortably. <laughs> or they would like pockets or they would not like things on their fingers that are preventing them being able to write properly right okay. yeah. so or chokers or things that constrict our breathing or like femininity mm. is about squishing us yeah mm. and constraining us and mm. making us occupy space in way particular ways the way we fold our legs the way we're taught to sit the way we're taught to move through the move through space right there's a very famous piece of feminist phenomenology called throwing like a girl which looks at the way in which men and women are taught to throw right and men are taught to throw overarm and to put their body into it and to step forward i throw like that because why would i throw like stupid underarm like standing on the spot <laughs> right because that's not how you get any force right but women are not taught to be we're not taught to be powerful. We're not taught okay. to occupy space. That's partly hmm. about inculcating us into being things that are attractive to men, hmm. right? Because generally excessive displays of subjectivity are antithetical to being attractive. Um, that's part of the problem. So hmm. the, one of the problems is we are inculcated in a value system in which we are taught to be attractive to men, we are taught to perform a femininity which makes us attractive to men, and we are taught to consider that we are valuable in terms of that. Okay. And at the same time, if you don't perform that, so to some extent you're punished if you perform that in a certain way, right? Because it has an effect on your, on your humanity. Hmm. Um, because you become an object. If you're taught to make yourself into an object and you perform that well, you become an object, right? Um, and that's a kind of violence to women's humanity. Mm -hmm. And if you reject it, because you decide you would actually be able to like to walk down the street without tottering like a gazelle or <laughs> wearing a pencil skirt that means you can't actually move your legs properly or like any of these things <laughs> then you're also punished in some respects for yeah. not performing femininity for being too i mean i think okay. for being too human for claiming too much subject agency okay yeah for claiming too much agency for not okay. being supplicant enough so yes women <clears throat> this whole issue about women and women's power and, and women's attractiveness right obviously i don't know what it's like to be a man yeah but women also have desire yeah like we experience desire too when we see attractive men walking down the street like, you know, I watch the scaffolders, like, down the road, <laughs> I mean, the scaffolding, and we're all like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> like, one of the things, right, is that this whole conceit about our objectness is, is, is a, there is a whole problem about our desire and your desire and, like, the fact that we're not, that that you are supposed to desire us and then we get to choose and you think it's like we're, we're vending machines or something like we're sitting there and we're just selecting right like we don't have a desire ourselves like we don't want people who don't want us that men don't get to choose their own mates like men don't just sleep with any woman like who comes along they also only sleep with women they're attracted to right <laughs> It's not the case that women have this, like, you know, incandescent power of selection 
which somehow is being denied men. This is this is a story. Men have desire. It may be the case that in their teenage years, right, you know, they go through a period where it's difficult for them to learn how to negotiate that. Yeah, yeah. But but puberty is pretty intense for women too, right? And we are also creatures that have desire. It's not the case, yeah? It's part of the story that we tell ourselves that hmm. women are just attractive, right? They don't have desire. Men have desire. Women exercise this power of selection, which is in some way violent because some men get accepted and some men get rejected. But you can't women just... I'm not saying that that's just the case, but you can't say that that's not the case either. Like that, that is something that is informing us, but it's not the the totality of the right. social experience. But is it not also the case that men make selections about their mates? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do really, do really good-looking men sleep with not particularly good-looking women? No, yeah. they don't. <laughs> really good making men but tend to pe people generally sleep with people who are roughly as attractive as themselves right but okay i just i just i want like, i wanted i just want to like just no, say that it's not all it's not all it's not entirely the desirer's responsibility to not desire Right. I, I'm saying that, that there are certain ways in which one presents themselves that elicits desire. And to deny right. that, to deny right. that is it, right. it's like it's like saying two plus two does not equal four. It's not saying it's equals five, but it's just saying that there's no there's no agency. There's no outcome to that. I'm sorry. Right. So, so but, 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 uh, but, right. Yes. Yeah. I know, I, I I know. There's a but. I'm just saying that 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 is that that. But, but, I'm, but, but I, the I don't... thing is, is that, is that what? Because because what this happens, what happens with this logic then is you go, okay. well, women have acted in this way to make themselves desirable. Therefore, they make us desire them, and therefore yeah, they're yeah, responsible okay. for how we how. And yeah. that's not that's not true. Women are positioned as objects of desire. Now, yeah, but do they do they not position themselves as objects? Of desire? We, I'm just saying to deny we, that we, that a we, woman we, does that yes, is to strip her of agency. We, we, do, we do, we don't have. I mean, we do have agency. Our agency is we either choose to be an object or we choose to not be an object, right? So the way I dealt with that was from after being sexually, you know, we get sexually harassed on the street, right? From about the age of 13 to about the age of 25, we more or less get consistently sexually harassed on the street. Mm -hmm. um, uh, around the age of 20, I'd had enough, right? Hmm. So I started wearing the equivalent of the burqa hmm. because I, I just had enough. Yeah. yeah? Yeah. And I'm not, you know, I'm not like, you know, Charlie Theron or whatever. I'm just like an average looking woman who happened to be 20 with blonde hair who was walking down the road, right? I've had enough. Most women get to a point. But the thing is, is that, but also we want, we want to attract mates. Yeah. Like, right? <laughs> so the choice that I had was either make yourself because we're in the street we're just going around our business right we're not sex vending machines we're just trying to go to the post office yeah yeah if you want to go if you if you hmm. if you if you see a woman in a context in which humans are engaging in like preliminary sexual like negotiation like a bar <laughs> yeah yeah then you can go and hit on someone if okay. a woman goes to the bar and she's dressed up she it's very rare for a woman in a bar with a bunch of other women if a guy looks at her to be like how dare you like hit on me because you're in a bar you're dressed up in a bar yeah if you're if you're in the street you're just going up like we take our bodies with us right we can't like go out without yeah them. well yeah i'm just saying that i'm just saying that they to completely I, I, all, all i wanted to say is that like there's a trope and, and this is like and and thank you for these conversations and it seems like we're going through and we're, we're wrestling through these tropes yeah, this, that get this, the conversation this, 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 stuck this, this, this and, is this is helpful because i understand this is this is the story that men tell or uh, that we hear right and it yeah. doesn't conform to our experience yeah, yeah, but d d d just there's a trope that 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 
seems to form a denial of responsibility. Like you can't just dress any bikini and walk down the street, right? Like women there, there don't is a dress line. In the, I know, women I know. Don't I'm, dress in bikinis and walk okay, down the okay, street. Okay, yeah. I'm not saying that they do. I'm just saying that there is a line. There, there's that that the, you do need to understand. And I'm not. I'm not excusing any behavior by saying this. I'm just saying that that there are certain ways in which you present yourself socially. Responsible for your desire. But if you present yourself in a certain way socially, no. you can, you will elicit a response. Are you saying that that under no circumstances do you have any responsibility We're for how you present yourself? We're not responsible for other people's desire, right? Men are responsible for their desire. They are also responsible for then how they are perfectly within their rights and we quite like it sometimes <laughs> when they express that desire when they express it in a way yeah that is safe right? safe and, when and they artistic it, and, and like actually has some when quality they express to it. it in a way that respects our humanity mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. appropriate yeah. doesn't treat us like sex vending machines yes and yeah, is but, not but and, is it, there... and is not and is there not. a way when that we, you can you, present you, yourself that makes you look like a sex object? Like there, there are ways, and I'm not saying that. The, I, do you, do you see what I'm just trying to say? Like it's just one. It's just like if no, I, I it, like like the saying, slut walk. If you walk away, sometimes women make themselves look attractive, right? And also yeah. sometimes men make themselves look attractive because yeah, we're I'm humans just saying that, that, that the way in which you make. present yourself will bring attention to different aspects of yourself. Like <sighs> that's all I'm trying to say. Are you saying that there's no like like if you wear yoga pants and you're bobbly bobbly down the street, like like you you don't have any effect, like like that 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 has more of an effect. But than you if might you... just be coming back from yoga. I know, I know. I'm not excusing. I'm not excusing sexual harassment at all. I'm just saying that that to deny but, but that the way. Why is it so necessary, right? Why is it so difficult just to go, she's just coming back from yoga, she's got yoga pants, she's got a nice ass, and then that's it. Why yeah. do you have to make us responsible for it? Why well, can't I'm... you just own the fact <laughs> that you see someone's ass and it makes you feel desire? Why can't you just own it? I like I like, own it and I keep it to it myself. Why does it need yeah. to be that she's dominating you with her ass? Like, she's not. She's just hmm. coming back from yoga. Like, <laughs> like most of the time when we get sexually harassed right we're just going about our business yeah right it actually doesn't matter what we look like we get sexually harassed all the freaking time right and like well what's the difference between harassment and and um what's not harassment but it has the same content like i want you um what's the what's the, how do you how do yeah, you but men, assess... but when we're sexually when we're, when we're sexually harassed on the street men never say that right like it's <laughs> most of the harassment isn't even a come on right that's the, that's the thing as <laughs> well like if you genuinely want to create some kind of expression of potential interaction right you don't shout like nice tits love out the car window. Does that happen? Yes, all the fucking time. Really? Like you don't understand what our lives are like. I when live in I a was, rural area, I, so everybody When I was <laughs> when I was twelve or thirteen years old, right, I walk I mean like seriously, this is the thing men don't understand. This is what we talk about, right? It would make your hair stand on end what happens to us. Right. When I was like 12 years old, I walked into a restaurant with my father and my mother and we were walking down an aisle. Right. Mm. Of a restaurant. And there was two guys sitting by the by the side of the aisle. And my dad was literally like five yards in front of me. And this bloke sitting by the aisle just put his hand straight between my lips. I was 12. That is a completely normal thing. To happen to women. That's not acceptable. No, it's not. And that's what, that, that is not, I'm not telling you some like horror, that is by far not one of the worst things that's happened to me or most women. Right? Did that you, stuff did, happened. Well, if no, you were in America, your dad could have just shot him, but you guys don't have <laughs> Yes, but kidding. we don't say anything. Yeah, okay. In, in my dad, culture, my dad, probably, my dad probably doesn't even know that story. I probably never even told him. We just go into shock and feel huh. ashamed. Okay. Right, which is what it's intended to do. Hmm. It's not intended as a come on. 
it's intended to remind us what we're there for. Hmm. Hmm. It's to put us in our place. Right? When a guy comes up to you in a bar, right, and, and sort of starts a conversation with you, like, there are issues there about how women negotiate not being interested and the possible negative consequences that happen. But that's not necessarily harassment, right? It might be harassment if I'm uh, standing at a bus stop, right? If we're just going about, generally men should assume that when women are going about their lives, they're going about their lives, right? And they're not mm. there to, they're not, they're not performing like, preliminary okay. courting behavior right yeah. but okay. when they're okay. in particular contexts right like this is one of the reasons i'm writing this book about prince right because i'm going to explain in glorious detail what the difference between harassment and seduction is right seduction is a thing like men you know like if if you want to understand how to negotiate that like there are ways of expressing desire right mm -hmm. that are not threatening that are not coercive that are not dehumanizing that don't make assumptions like there are ways of doing that and we're not necessarily adverse to that in contexts where we've gone to places with the possibility of that happening. Can, can, is there no wiggle room to say that, that there are certain forms of dress that position the female form more as an object than other forms of dress? There is that, certainly... That accentuate... Or, yeah, of course. Femininity is about accentuating women's appeal as an object, yeah. right? That's what it's for. That's so, what we're uh, that's, uh, in. But okay. the question, when, but, but the, the two questions I want to ask you is, if, if we want to talk about the kind of conversations that solutions, right? And, and is one of the questions that I really want to ask is, is hmm. to try and think about where this need to make women responsible for that is why what is going on with the perception that women's attractiveness is a form of like nefarious i'm not saying that. no 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 i'm not saying you are i'm just saying that there's a trope okay, okay. in the culture okay right okay. And we have all of these images the femme fatale and the this and the yeah. that right Men experience their desire for women as women having a form of illegitimate power over them, which they then resent, right? Mm. Okay. And that's one of the primary mechanisms of the violence, right? Mm. Because it, yeah. creates, it creates resentment, and then resentment creates frustration and coercion. And yeah. as soon as we... And, and, and if, like, seriously, guys, if you want to get laid, that's, the, like, the, the most ineffective way possible, right? Mm. Because... Because as soon as we experience anything that feels like resentment, we immediately feel that someone's with potential danger, right? And if you want to hit on a woman, making her feel scared is like definitely not the way to do it. <laughs> um, that we have to have an out. We have to. We have our subjectivity has to remain intact, right? For it to be safe, we have to know that we are free to exercise a choice, right? As soon as there's any pressure or any coercion or any resentment, we immediately, I mean, like we talked about before, this is what's going on with the incels, right? So, so mm -hmm. my, the question, right, is actually if we want to talk about how to make this whole thing work better, yeah. one of the things that's really important is us for us to start thinking about why men find this ownership of their desire and the way in which they experience like i'm not saying women are not attractive and or that femininity we're inculcated right you see they give us little makeup sets and like do our hmm. hair and like when we're we're trained for that shit hmm. right mm -hmm. we are trained to perform femininity so that we are attractive to men if we want then want to say, is an individual woman responsible for that? Well, she's either chosen to perform femininity or not, right? But either way, as I said, it's kind of a double bind. Like, mm. there are problems okay. with both of those. Yeah. Yeah. But if we want to talk about what to do, the only way, women don't have an option of blaming men for their desire. 
There's no, there's no narrative in this culture. Wait, for about men, for women. Men can you imagine? Be... Can you can, can you can you imagine a story in which in which women, right, women with extreme desire, right? There's nothing romantic about that. That's that's fatal attraction. That's like mad, crazy bunny boy in a woman, right? <laughs> there is no narrative in this culture about women's desire, about how women feel about men not reciprocating their desire. Do women feel dominated by desiring men? No, we do not, because there's no narrative support or symbolization for that whatsoever. If we went around um, resenting men for the fact that we desire them, which we do, yeah, and very deeply and profoundly in ways that are not represented in this culture, there, there's, no, there's no story around that. Like, we'd get no traction. We'd just be treated like crazy hysterical witches. Hmm. Right? But but we have a whole narrative about the power of male desire and, and women's allure. Is that celebrated? Yeah. I mean, it's not just celebrated, like the, the shameful male. The, the, the incel is, is the, the no, lowest no, form no, of no, internet no, no, entity, no. you know? Yes, so, I mean, it's not... The, in, the incel is a particular thing, but we have... There are lot, there is lots of work on... Hmm. Like the romantic hero, and you know, and the and you know the the power of like pursuing the the unattainable princess, and like we have a lot of narratives about that, right? Hmm. We have a lot of problems with getting stalking taken seriously, for example, right? Hmm. I mean, one of my friends wrote a piece about this. There was a guy whose girlfriend had left him, and he decided he was going to like sit outside her house and play piano, hmm. like endlessly, right? And it was kind like say anything, like, but just on perpetual. Huge, this huge like romantic gesture, and we're like, no, that's really creepy and stalky and weird. Like mm. you, she said, leave it alone. Like if a woman, mm. if women, just I mean, just try and think about like the re the the representation. I mean, and, and and obviously, like I say, I don't know what it's like to be a man, but I know what it's like to be a teenage girl, and teenage girls get insane deep obsessive crushes on male people who reject them yeah. and um like well why, why aren't the why aren't those stories being written why aren't women writing those stories because because women's desire is humiliating like because because a woman who can't uh, who who is obsessively attracted because because the trope is fatal attraction because the trope is like you're a crazy banshee lady yeah but I'm I'm just saying I'm just saying like like the the, the problem that I see with this critique and I'm sorry to to push back against you but like it seems you can, like you can push back it's fine it's you, you want that story to be written by somebody else you want somebody to go around and write that story I mean like why isn't that story being written like if that if, why isn't the trope there it, maybe 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 maybe, could... maybe 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 it should be I mean. I mean, yeah. all, I, all I can say is, right, in another yeah. world, I would like those stories written. And we do tell stories about, like, but it, it doesn't have the same, like, hmm. I can only tell you from how it looks to me from my part of the world, right? But, oh, my part of the world, where I'm positioned and, and, and this is actually probably, you're right, I should think about this more. I, my perception of it has always been that, um, yeah, that there is something laughable, slightly humiliating, embarrassing about about that. There's a and lot of modern fiction, uh, post-war modern fiction, about like the pathetic male. Um, and, and it's always been like those stories and I think like Saul Bellow probably writes them and sometimes Philip Roth will dip into this like the pathetic male and it's always very uncomfortable because it's very shameful to like be inside of this kind of like this loser's head or like watching watching this kind of this character like sorry and what's, uh, what's, go through what's, the world. what's pathetic what is the what would you say is the core like, in what sense are they pathetic well, uh, the, the, well, just like the, they um, they failed at something, or the, they they can't fit into the world, or they're shamed, or society's cast them out. In in a modern where, world, it's like very alienated. 
Uh, but I wanted to say that, that that fiction, it's very uncomfortable to be inside of that person's head. And just from, from I only worked in a bookstore for a couple of years, so I don't know completely, but I see that, that women are devourers of fiction. Um, yeah, we read a lot of fiction. Read a lot of fiction, but it seems like the, the fiction that's more attractive is, I mean, and, and I don't mean like that women don't branch out in the literature because there's a lot of literature written by women and it's just a huge uh, archive, especially, I think that's, that's like one of the, that, that's one of the sea changes in, in the perception of the females when the novel came about and, and we had women novelists like really actually yes. showing us the internal and the internality of the female that I don't think any tech, technology was capable of actually containing until we had the, the printing press because of the way in which it's it's not memorizable it's 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 more it's prosaic and and it's flowy you know i'm thinking emily bronte but right yes um the novel is uh, in certain sense a feminine yeah a feminine yeah it's form. a feminine form but i just i wonder like like if you're if you're making a critique about like this art not being out there because there's something that that is repulsive for women to actually like like want to read that and want to be inside of that head whereas well, no, like, because the I, think romantic... we feel, I think i think i think we feel ashamed as well right yeah. i think we and i it, mean in this culture i'm not saying like hmm. men like men have a problem with their desire women are greater we all have a problem with that start desire is a really difficult thing to negotiate yeah. right like it's a profoundly difficult human experience because it's very, very powerful mm -hmm. and it's incredibly vulnerable, yeah. right? Because you yeah. really, really, really... It empowers really... you and strips you of power at the same time. Right. Now, that vulnerability, like, I guess what I'm kind of getting at when I'm talking about the need to project it, right, mm -hmm. is, is that it's an incredibly vulnerable experience it happens, you know, when we're very young, like we get overtaken by the stuff and we're not actually emotionally mature enough to process it properly. And, and some of us are never emotionally mature enough to process it properly. Um, I don't, you know, I'm not saying, oh, we're all, you know, women are great at it. Right? I, th I don't think we are, right? We also are contending with the fact that we also, there is this narrative, you know, these narrative absences to a certain extent, right? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. the images, for example, if you think about what women, yeah. again, this is one of the reasons why I'm interested in prints, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. very interested in how it makes female desire visible, right? And the, the, I'm very interested in the fact that men have written all the books about prints, but Prince was almost entirely interested in, in talking to women's desire, right? It's all directed at women's desire. And the men are just like, la, la, la. they don't even, they, they, they barely notice, right? And if they do notice, it's not considered to be very important, right? If you think about pop music, we have figures of female desire. We do, actually, but they're all very it's teenage. It's like Beatlemania or like, you know, like fangirly or like, mm. women also write a lot of erotica, right? They, they yeah. write fan fiction. Most fan fiction is written by women. It's endless pages and millions of pages of women fantasizing about their famous TV characters fucking each other, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> we do do that, right? Yeah. You know, every now and again you drop into, it's like it's where Twilight came from, you know? Like, I yeah. once fell, I once fell into like a Doctor Who fan fiction tunnel for like <laughs> three months. It was like insane. There's a whole, there's a whole genre a fan fiction written by women, like hard fanfic, like it's hard porn, right? Basically women fantasizing about David Tennant in a blue suit, having sex with David Tennant in a brown suit and <laughs> Rose at the same time. <laughs> this stuff is great, <laughs> right? But fan fiction's kind of sneered at, right? It's oh, kind yeah. of... Well, I right. mean, but yeah, but what's the number one selling book of all time besides the Twilight. Bible? Right. No, it wasn't Twilight. It was it was like Twilight on uh, on Viagra. Oh, it was it was, it was, uh, it was it Fifty was Shades. Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh my God, that book is so awful. <laughs> anyway, it's it's it's. I mean, and 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 most fan fiction is is sneered at because it's very terrible. But people should really check out the Doctor. Some of the Doctor Who fans. <laughs> actually, Doctor Who fans. Well, are you kind of, know what? You should you Doctor should curate kind of, the best. Of. Doctor Who fans are kind of smart, so they write actually fairly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> erotica it's erotica women you know the novel is a female form we tend to like our porn written down um yeah. so but but it's there 
right? There are these forms of expressions of female desire, but they're not, they generally don't take center stage. Unfortunately, Fifty Shades of Grey was probably not the greatest example of that. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I, I think that the, the, there, if there's a market for it, it will be exploited by the market. Like, well, well of, of, yes, it it will, it will. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not. Like I said, right? There is work. I mean, it, it's and it's difficult, right? It's difficult in terms of female desire because our desire hmm. is um, mediated. Comes back to what you were saying, right? Our desire is so um, deeply mediated by how we are being perceived, right? So women's desire is very often structured around being desired rather than around our own desire. We have relatively few articulations and relatively few representations, actually, Mm -hmm. things that I recognize as being, hmm. to use the word authentic, but like what female, because de- female desire actually is not pretty, right? Hmm. It's not pretty and it's not passive and it's not sitting there being like, hmm. yeah. The, the construction of what is female, so very often what we get in this culture is women's choice or women's sexuality being exercised by women performing what they perceive to be being desirable. Mm-hmm. Rather than necessarily actually expressing what their own desire is. Well, I mean, you can say the same with men. Like men have to, you know, shave and and you know, like at least clean up their act on a very surface. Not level since not order. since the hipsters liberated you. All. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I just uh, I, we we should start wrapping up because I have to go back to work. But um, I, I think that I think we're making headway. I think that we're we're circling around things, and and I just I want to model a discourse where we can disagree and and still see that there there's more than just one side. And and if we can get the discourse to go forward, I think the discourse w- between feminism and I guess the normative culture is has been stuck in certain ways and maybe that pent-up frustration has come around and, and reared its ugly head in this complete denial of sex at all i don't know that, that i'm just throwing that out there but i think if we can continue the dialogue and and you know find out where i'm wrong and and find out where i can make some concession where this is a this is a if it's not to be totalitarian, if feminism is, is to make a mark and not be authoritarian, there has to be a give and take. There has to be a, 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 a dialogue, of, a back and forth, a, a question I, and I, answer. Ab- 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 absolutely, right? Which is why I'm having this conversation with you. Right? I mean, I, we can produce all the analysis in the world, right? We can't actually change this structure, right? Hmm. We can't... Um, Men, we need to work out how to communicate about this. And firstly, like I said, I'm not an authoritarian and I believe in the importance of dialogue and I believe in the importance of explaining ideas, even when you don't disagree with each other. And I think we're doing, you know, there are a lot of things we don't agree about. There are some things we do agree about. But I think modeling this is important, right? And particularly now, given the way things are going. Yeah. Um, but also I am really interested in trying to find out and trying to work through what the blocks to hearing are, right? Because mm. I'm I'm not interested in coercing people. Mm. And the only way this will change is if we can find out how to communicate across across those gaps, right? And where the defensiveness is and where the snags are and what isn't being heard and we also you know we don't exist in the world in the same place right so there is a lot of things you know like you were shocked when i told you that story yeah Uh, a lot of men don't understand a lot of men who are upset about the gillette advert don't understand what our experience is like so they're like why are you accusing us of this stuff and we're like because we get it all the time from all sides and it's not we're not saying it's all of you but we get enough of it right and and it's very hard for us to communicate that experience so we do need to talk 
I, I don't have any solutions. I have a lot of analysis that I'm prepared to share. I don't know how convincing it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm convinced. <laughs>